suspicious. We may think, well, I will give in charity, I'll open a hospital, I will um, save the poor, or I'll, I'll save an endangered species, um, I'll do some material good. But, and that we may think that, consider that auspicious. And it is, it's true, it's a good thing. Bhagavad Gita says we should do charitable activity. But at the same time, we may open a hospital, but that hospital may also be filled with disease, death, disease, old age, dying. So how, we can, how can you call a hospital an auspicious place? It's actually a place where people have to exit this world in painful circumstances. So yeah, it's, it's charitable to open a hospital, but Prabhupada says that the, whatever auspicious or good we do in this material world, is there's certainly enough bad that it's counteracted by it. It's not, it's not as though we can change the material world and make it a good place. It, there, it's always going to be birth, death, disease, old age in this material world. So, but also Prabhupada is saying here that pure devotional service is the beginning of all auspiciousness. So evidently there is some such a thing as auspiciousness. Auspicious, pure, good, auspicious activity actually does exist. But it exists on the transcendental platform. Auspiciousness exists when we put aside our own personal uh, egocentric activity and think on the terms of what will give pleasure to Krishna and what will give satisfaction and happiness to the Lord. When we're thinking about what will give satisfaction to the Lord, it is like watering a root of a tree. The water goes to the root, the root soaks up the water, and the water goes to all the leaves and branches in the tree, right? So if we go to the tree and we try to sprinkle a little water on each leaf, we, you know, I'll do this, I'll try that, I'll do this, I'll try that, and that'll make the tree happy. Let me water this leaf, this leaf looks like it needs watering. Uh, let me water this leaf down here, it looks like it needs watering. Oh, and I could do some good by watering the leaves on the top of the tree. But in the meanwhile, the, the roots are dry, you know. The roots are dry so the tree isn't nourished. So by watering the root of the tree, which is Krishna, then automatically satisfaction is given to all living beings because Krishna is satisfied. And uh, we start to understand what is our actual position in relationship to other people and other souls. You know, that we're not, I'm not the sole care, t the only caretaker of my husband or my kids. Krishna's in charge, you know. I'm not the only caretaker of um, my wife or my, uh, my mother. No, it's out of our control, really. We can do our very best, and we certainly should, but Krishna's in charge, you know. And despite whatever remedial treatments we may offer, it, ultimately it's up to Krishna uh, what, what the outcome is for someone who's ill or like that. So the next one is happiness. Pure devotional service. The third symptom of pure devotional service is it brings us complete, perfect happiness. And you can try it by, by engaging in uh, some acts of, of service to Krishna, by hearing about him, by singing to his deity, um, by reading uh, Krishna's scriptures, by associating with devotees who are of the like mind of doing service, by cooking and offering the food to Krishna before we eat it, um, by offering some lamp to Krishna. It's by just taking a few steps in that direction, then our happiness is secured. We actually feel uh, the karma uh, that has disturbed us, and we're all a little, at least I know, I'm a little under the influence of karma. There's some anxiety and stress in my day-to-day -day living. I don't know about you, but I've, I feel that from day to day there's some kind of cloud hanging over like, okay, try to do this and get this done and get that done and oh, this didn't work and oh, I'm so upset about this and that da, 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 and it goes on and on. It's like a, a I'm not gonna say a nightmare, but sometimes it feels like a nightmare. And then sometimes it feels like a nice dream, but it's still without offering the effects or the results to Krishna, it's entangling and confusing and stressful. So if we take whatever it is of that day, if, if, even if it's a problem, and say, Krishna, here, please take this problem. I don't know what to do with it. 
I don't, I don't know. I don't really know how to look at it. I, I, I haven't in, even been able to get a handle on how to start to solve it. You know, but Krishna will show us. He'll reveal to us. And then by offering our food to Krishna, we become purified. Um, when we offer our, the food that we cook to Krishna, uh, it, it frees us from the modes of nature when we eat that food. It's a, it, it puts us in a, a state of being where we can actually be more in touch with Krishna in transcendental service to him. So uh, pure devotional service is uh, the opportunity for all happiness, pure happiness. It's the beginning of all happiness. It's only the beginning. If we continue with it, continue pure devotional service, a lifetime of service, then we have a very happy life. Regardless of whatever material karma is due us, whatever is coming, whatever sinful reactions are coming, even if we do have a lot of sinful reactions coming to us in our life, if we just offer this one lifetime to Krishna, we will be happy. We'll be happy throughout all of it because we'll be connected to Krishna and he's all happiness. He's all bliss, all knowledge, all eternity. Then the fourth one is pure devotional service derides the concept of liberation. That's a hard one to understand. Pure devotional service derides, it makes fun of. Bye, thank you for coming. He's smiling at me. <laughs> He's been fine, thank you. Pure devotional service makes fun of liberation. How, how do you understand that? Because a person, a devotee who's engaged, even a new devotee who's just starting out on the path of bhakti, if he just does a little service, he starts to realize that, oh, I'd, I'd really rather, much rather be engaged in my duties of serving Krishna here at the temple than I would, you know, being just set on a path of liberation from the body, you know. Like, what, 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 what will that take me? You know, just being liberated and losing my personal identity, the soul just going into the Brahma Jyoti and merging into some kind of light or energy. I'd much rather be me serving Krishna. It's so, it's so much more uh, tangible and real, you know. So he, uh, uh, even a new Bhakta will think, he'll, he'll, he'll uh, criticize uh, this desire for, you know, just uh, losing one's personal identity and merging into the Brahman, you know. So pure devotional service, it derides even the conception, you know, even if you don't even know what liberation feels like, even if you have never experienced Brahman realization, pure devotional service, a, 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 a person who is practicing pure devotional service who's never experienced Brahman realization, he will just laugh at it anyway because his pleasure from knowing and loving the Supreme Personality of Godhead is so great that the very thought of liberation is, sounds like something, you know, not pleasing, not, not something he's attracted to. So um, the monists or the, the Brahma, Brahmavadis or Mayavadis, they're interested in losing their own personal identity and their relationship with God. They rather do that in favor of um, of having no personal identity. They, anyway, I'm not explaining it so well. It's kind of like the the, Brahm, the, the Brahmavadis will say that there's a lot of green parrots and they go into the tree and the, they, they match the tree. You can't, I saw some parrots today in a tree and you can't tell the parrots from the tree because they're green and the tree is green. So they're saying that the souls at the end of the lifetime are not meant to be individual, that they're meant to be merged into a complete spiritual energy and they don't have to experience the suffering of being in the body anymore because they're merged with the Brahman energy. And that's their conception of spiritual life, that that's what you do. That's, that's the goal. You know, there's nothing beyond that. And they think, they actually think that Krishna consciousness is a stepping stone toward that goal. It's just a transitional religious phase that you go through until you realize that you don't have a personality. So <laughs> Bhagavad Gita explains, no, your personality is eternally existent and you don't lose the personality. The reason they want to lose the personality is because their experience of personality in this material world is suffering. 
It's like, oh, I have a personal relationship with this person, but this person hasn't been nice to me or my wife cheated on me.